Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Suresh Sundaration, uh, Columbia Business School. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, our two uh, guests here, uh, Tim Ferguson uh, uh, from Next Street uh, and uh, Noah Breslow uh, on deck. Uh, I did some research, uh, you know, by looking through the websites of uh, these two uh, companies. Uh, uh, what looks to be very innovative, uh, you know, ideas for uh, growth with, uh, uh, you know, uh, equality. That's the theme of this uh, conference. So what I thought I would do was to let uh, each of the speaker, uh, you know, maybe five to ten minutes to introduce themselves, their organization, uh, you know, their business model, uh, what they see as, uh, you know, some of the challenges and opportunities, and then uh, using my prerogative as the chairman of this session, I have a couple of questions that I would like to pose, uh, and then I'll uh, you know, uh, throw, the op throw open uh, the session uh, for the audience. So let me start with uh, uh, Tim Ferguson. Tim. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tim Ferguson. I'm the founder of a company called Nextry. Um, we, the business model is, is a very old-fashioned um, model for those of you who are students of economic history, called a merchant bank. Um, and merchant banks um, were basically established and, and grew over the centuries to be um, connectors to helping entrepreneurs and owners to make things happen. Um, primarily, they were in the advisory business, um, but they also provided access to capital. So our mission, we're a modern day version of that, is to provide world-class advisory services and access to capital to smaller businesses uh, in inner cities um, across America. Um, so we're all about the urban core. We're all about the underserved markets. Definition of a small business for us is um, two parts of the continuum. So four or five million up to 70 or $80 million in revenues. Um, so the so-called, which was referred to earlier today for a much, much smaller revenue number, but we would call that the real domestic missing middle. You know, they're banked. Um, but they do not have access to growth capital, and I'm not talking about venture or private equity, I'm talking about debt, um, that allows them to really grow um, and to expand, and they certainly, for the most part, don't have access to the same quality of services that someone like um, McKinsey, BCG, Bain, um, would provide to businesses with 100 million or more of revenues. Um, you know, we. Um, have a, you know, what I would call double bottom line component to what we do because everything, one way or another because of our focus, our place-based focus, creates jobs, creates wealth in inner cities, um, or has a large component um, of economic development. When I think about the customers that we serve, the constituents that we work with, everything bridges back to the small businesses or the nonprofits. So the split of our, our, our clients is roughly 70% small businesses and 30% nonprofits. Um, they came to us with the same set of issues that the small businesses did, and provided that they were working and we could screen them um, uh, in the inner city, um, then we were comfortable to provide them with services too. Um, the second group is what we call government, so federal, state, and city. And much to my surprise, they've actually been very big movers in terms of opening their own supply chains to minority and women-owned small businesses um, in our urban communities. Um, they heard something being said in Washington, which was that if you want more money to flow to you from us, then you need to be able to show us the impact that you're having in terms of employment in particular um, in, uh, in the urban core. Um, so, you know, for example, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts of a client, is a client of ours in New York City um, the New York City EDC is a client of ours, and we will work with them to help to build um, capacity in smaller businesses in those cities um, uh, so that they are able to win and then execute um, contracts um, uh, as vendors within those particular supply chains. Um, the, uh, the other sort of work that we do for cities is that often they will have um, a need for something around economic development. So for example, in the city of New Haven, we've been working with them on a kitchen incubator, um, and we're in the process of implementing that on their behalf, and we're actually, um, as a result of that work, being asked to look at something on a regional economic basis as well. Um, 
The other group is what we call large enterprise. So um, for us, that means the anchor institutions, so the educational institutions like a Columbia, um, medical institutions, um, and then large corporates. And what we've seen is that the educational institutions are really moving because they care that the areas, the communities, the neighborhoods surrounding their campuses, they want to have not just be safe, which is you know, a pejorative term, but they also want to have economic vitality within it. And outside of Penn, um, I think it's been really, really slow in general on that front, but in the last year or two, we've seen a significant pickup. So just in the last year, clients of ours include Northeastern University, Johns Hopkins University, University of Chicago, as they all try to figure out how they engage more effectively um, with the communities that surround the campus. Medical institutions are a little slower to move, but they're being forced to because of the Affordable Care Act. So that's beginning to happen as well. Um, and and uh, the large corporates, we see almost no movement from. And I know that there's, um, you know, th there are always exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, um, you know, we've seen them be involved um, uh, internationally and less um, here in the domestic US. Uh, we have about 43 professionals um, you know, offices in Boston, New York, um, and you asked what the challenges were. The challenges, and I'm going to echo something that Keisha Cash, who we've known for a while, um, said when she was up here on the panel, it's unlocking you know, what I think of as institutional capital. Uh, and I would include within that the larger family offices of the, um, the ultra high net worth as well. It's very, very difficult to do. So for somebody like us, both capitalizing Next Street itself and also um, capitalizing asset pools that would allow us to lend on a forward-looking basis as opposed to a historic underwriting model uh, that the banks currently employ um, has been extraordinarily difficult to do. I don't know what the catalyst is going to be, and it'll be interesting to see whether any of that comes out as we go on. Thank you. Noah? Hi, so I'm uh, Noah Breslow. I'm the CEO of On Deck. Um, on Deck was really founded uh, sort of with two basic insights um, about small business, uh, which is the, the segment that we serve. Uh, the first insight was really that um, if you're a small business in this country, you're an independent donor, you have between 100000 and say $5 million of annual revenue, um, you have a hard time getting a loan from a traditional bank. And, and the, the decline rates um, are, are you know, upwards of 70%, of 80% at the largest banks. They're a little bit lower at many of the community banks, but, but a lot of these folks in this segment, whether you're a restaurant, a grocery store, an auto repair store, uh, or, a, or a nail salon, you know, feel, feel excluded and have trouble accessing uh, traditional financing. I think the second insight that allowed us to start the company was um, more and more electronic data about how these businesses are performing is, is available. Um, if you think about how the average small business owner kept track of their finances 20 years ago, it was with a general ledger, um, you know, and, and, and they wrote it out by hand. But if you sort of look, uh, you know, with, with online accounting software like QuickBooks, um, with the, the explosion in the use of online banking by small business owners, um, 10 years ago, penetration of online banking was like 30%. You know, now it's over 90% of small business owners use online banking. Um, so so uh, you think about social data as well, things like OpenTable, Yelp, Foursquare, those weren't even around five or six years ago. But now they have coverage over just about every small business in the country in a lot of verticals. So the idea behind On Deck was pretty straightforward. It was build a technology platform that can um, aggregate these different electronic data sources about these small underserved businesses and then use that data to more efficiently get them a loan. Um, you know, so that, that was really the original thought uh, behind the business. Um, and uh, we're, we're a classic venture capital backed technology startup. Our product just happens to be a loan. Um, so all the sort of things you hear about with people losing money for years on end, building technology platforms to try and solve a problem, we're, we're definitely a company that falls into that category. The flip side of it is now we think we do have something that works and scales. Um, so if you look at where the company is today, we, uh, we, we funded over $900 million in, in loans now to small businesses across the country, about 725 different industries or, or NAICS codes as we think about it, um, and, and growing very, very quickly. Uh, a business owner can go, uh, if you look at how um, it works in the traditional lending environment, it takes about 30 days on average, uh, this is data from McKinsey and Equifax last year, for a small business to get a term loan from a bank. 
Uh, so from the moment you walk into the branch to submit the application, to get the decision, to close the loan, it's a 30-day process. And if you're getting declined um, more often than not, you'll have to go to multiple banks in parallel. So, so that's a very time-consuming, lengthy process for small business owners. Uh, the, the technology we've developed allows us to do that process much more quickly. Uh, so today a business owner can come to our website um, and in about 10 minutes get approved for a loan of up to $35,000. We can fund that loan within a day. Um, if you want a loan of up to $250,000, we can't turn that around immediately online, but we do turn that around in several hours and we can get you funding within about 48 hours. So, so we've really tried to compress the time um, that it takes to, to get a loan if you're a small business owner. Um, and, and we also try and make it easier and more convenient because we're leveraging a lot of electronic data collection to avoid collecting a lot of physical documentation uh, from the business owner themselves. Um, you know, uh, I think, I mean, we can sort of get more into uh, some of the questions, but I think it, it's been a fascinating business to be involved with. You know, I think it's not a double bottom line business, to be clear. This is a for-profit technology company at the end of the day, but there is a, a clear economic impact. We have data that, that shows, as we've observed businesses over the years, um, you know, we, we, we see a clear correlation to job creation. We see a clear correlation between taking these loans and growing revenue. Um, and for many of these entrepreneurs, a lot of them are first generation, uh, you know, Americans um, starting their first business. Many of these businesses are too young to be approved by banks. They're in their second or third or fourth year of operation. Um, so, so we do see um, a real economic development story. And recently, now that the platform is more mature, we have started to partner with um, economic development organizations. We have a partnership with um, the AEO, which is a nonprofit that is actually mentioned earlier, um, and a few CDFIs around the country, where they're leveraging our platform um, but taking their mission, their, their capital, and their credit model and, and sort of plugging it into the platform we've built because we really do see a role for ourselves, really just lowering the cost of delivering these smaller dollar loans uh, to these end users. That's great. Uh, I want to sort of uh, drill down a little bit deeper uh, into these issues. Uh, and I'll limit myself to just a couple of remarks so that the audience have uh, the chance to uh, ask you the questions. Uh, you know, I look at uh, organizations, peer-to-peer -peer lending organizations like lending clubs and, you know, uh, Prosper. Uh, they seem to be delivering of the order of $2 billion within a short period of time uh, loans. You know, sort of uh, how do you, this is a question more direct. Uh, directed mm -hmm. towards uh, NOAA, how do you sort of, uh, you know, see you, uh, your organization fitting in there? I know that they address households and perhaps you address uh, business, so the scale and the, uh, you know, monitoring issues are a little bit different. Uh, and the second question, which is something that I would like to pose to both of you, is, you know, uh, in India, uh, when uh, the financial inclusion issue came about, uh, large banks were mandated to lend 35% of their loan book to priority sector. And one of the ways in which they tried to fulfill that was to lend to microloan, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, possibilities, uh, opportunities. And they said, well, uh, we're going, we have the capital, but we're going to find the local micro microfinance institution, give the capital, and then that microfinance institution will have to take the first 10% of the losses. So that essentially the supply of capital was more or less risk-free from the perspective of the banks and they were able to fulfill the priority sector uh, requirement. I would like to, so uh, I'd like both of you to sort of talk a little bit about your funding sources, uh, what their potential concerns are, and uh, the incentives that you have to face in terms of absorbing delinquencies and losses, especially given a very short turnaround that your, uh, your organization is able to provide on these somewhat largish loans compared yep. to micro loans. Okay. So, uh, so to address the first part of the question, um, the similarities or differences between on deck and the peer-to-peer -peer consumer lenders like Lending Club and Prosper, um, we, we do view, I think, if you look at the, um, the, the overall space, we do view them as kind of kindred spirits, and I think all of these companies will wind up falling into a category of alternative financing, um, and, and these companies will grow up and mature, and I think you'll see a number of different asset classes. Um, there's some uh, companies going after student loans, for example, so folks in the room, um, you know, if you've heard of Sophie or Common Bond or companies like this, they're, they're trying to disrupt the student loan market in the way we're taking our respective markets and, and handling that. Um, but the difference is, is in the target. Um, so, so the typical lending club or prosper borrower is consolidating credit card debt from a Capital One uh, or, or, or American Express or whatever it is, and, uh, and then getting that loan peer-to-peer -peer funded through the platforms that Lending Club and Prosper have built. But they're largely using consumer underwriting, using standard FICO score type approaches um, and income verification uh, to provide the loan. 
And, uh, and I think the primary difference really with on deck is, is sort of several fold. One is we're, we're wholly focused on the SMB segment. Um, and our, our core thesis is that we're not taking a customer that was served by Chase or um, Bank of America. Um, we're generally taking a customer that hasn't been served well by Chase or Bank of America and getting them a loan. And so because of that, we've developed a very different underwriting model. We have something we call the on-deck score. And just like FICO underwrites a consumer, the on-deck score is really designed to use all this alternative data to underwrite a Main Street business. Um, so because we had to prove the model ourselves, and this gets to the second part of your question, um, we had to prove that the on-deck score actually worked. And we had to do it using our own money before we could get investors to really back up our loans on, on our platform. So I think that's one of the main differences with our model and Prosper and Lending Club is for the predominance of our loans, we are in the first loss position. And, uh, and we do hold those loans, if you will, on our balance sheet. Uh, and so from that, from a financial statement point of view, we have some similarities more to a bank than we do to a technology company. Um, now we see that evolution um, moving as, as our loans get more mature, our credit model gets more mature, we see investors willing to take more of the risk. In some cases now they're taking all the risk, as you would on a Lending Club or Prosper type platform. Um, but, but that has been an evolution over time. So I think, you know, the, and the final piece is loan size. The average Lending Club or Prosper loan, I believe, is in the thirteen dollars to $15,000 range, maybe slightly higher now. Um, to, a, to an individual, the average on deck loan is about $40,000 to, to, again, a business. So I'll deal with the second part because there is no comparison for us on, on the first question. Um, you know, th that's, it's an enormously complicated question to ask. Um, you know, in the United States, um, CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, requires commercial banks to have a certain amount of lending or activity um, within underserved markets. But the reality is that 95% of those loans or of those assets um, are, in, are backed in one way or another by real estate. So effectively, they're real estate lenders. Very few um, are actually lending to, sm to small businesses. Um, and you know, I think that the hardest segment of all to deal with, and it's interesting what Noah was saying about the denial rates at the banks in general, well, just think about this, is that for minority and women-owned businesses, it's six to seven times what it is for a white male um, owned business, so it's it's actually it's it's even it's even worse than the the data that he was talking about. The second part is that the CDFI community, who um, and we are actually a, a, a CDFI, one of the few for-profit CDFIs in the country, is that um, they're fundamental. They're primarily funded by the banks, by the CRA, the community finance organisations within the banks. So they are applying exactly the same set of standards that they would, in and I know there's some flex around it, but in general, to um, uh, how they would look at a small business loan. So it's very, very difficult for the CDFIs to move from housing orientation towards a small business orientation. So um, you know, it, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult from a regulatory point of view. I think that there are some encouraging signs um, in the sense that, yes, there's going to have to be some form of first loss reserve on asset pools that get raised. For example, in the work that we did recently for Northeastern University, and this is, this is public, as part of their approval process with the Boston Redevelopment Authority for their 20-year campus master plan, they agreed that they would provide a first loss reserve for a fund that will effectively be a receivables financing fund for local um, minority and women-owned businesses within the zip codes that surround the campus. That will finance 100% of their, any receivable that they have with the university. The leverage, which will come from probably more mission-based investors, so social impact-based investors, um, uh, will be three to four times that. Um, that's unusual. You know, we don't have the capital to be able to do the first loss reserve, um, so that means that it has to come from somewhere else. And the banks will not look at that because they want to look at everything on a historic basis as opposed to a forward-looking basis. And that's the disruptive part of the model that we're trying to put into place, but it's very, very difficult to make it happen. Loan sizes, it depends. If we're working in the five to, to 50 or 60 million range, the average loan size is gonna be somewhere in the, in the you know, one to $2 million uh, area. If you look at, we also manage and run on behalf of SBS, the Small Business Services Agency in New York, their Small Business Solutions Center for Lower Manhattan. So there were 3,000 walk-ins there last year. 
and we underwrote 150 loans on behalf of banks, um, and the average size of those loans was $50,000. Very helpful. Uh, one last question to both of you. Uh, interest rates are at an all-time low. Uh, the Federal Reserve has kept it uh, near zero level. Uh, I wonder what, you know, that, uh, my first uh, you know, immediate reaction would be that should lower the cost of your funding. Uh, somehow banks are able to give you money at a fairly low rate. How would uh, your uh, you know, model be affected, let's say, if the U.S. economy picks up and Federal Reserve starts to increase the interest rates and, let's say, the short-term interest rates go from 50 basis points to 4 or 5 percent? What, where do you see uh, that? How do you see that affecting your business? Um, I can take that first. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. We, we get that question frequently, and, and I think the spread that you just mentioned, the 50 basis points to 5%, that we would feel that. Um, so I don't want to insinuate that we wouldn't, but I think a smaller move we probably wouldn't feel as much. Um, you know, it, there's a couple reasons why. One is if rates are rising at the Fed, and I'm not an economist, so forgive me if I butcher this completely, but the, it means the economy is doing better which means that in general what's good for, for the economy is good for small business, is good for on deck. I mean, we, we really do see a high correlation to our default rates and economic cycles, as you'd expect. Um, so, so my sense is that if rates are going to improve a little bit, or sorry, not improve, increase a little bit, our default rates are probably going to improve a little bit in conjunction, so our overall bottom line is going to stay about neutral. Now, I think drop, you know, jumping up 450 basis points, that one would start to be a little bit more painful, um, but, uh, but I think uh, I don't see that on the horizon anytime soon. So, so I think it depends how you look at it. If you're looking at it from the point of view of the traditional financial system and the, and the way that that's been funded, then yes, any, any increase in cost of funding is going to, inc is going to affect you know, the providers of, of that capital. Um, but um, if you look at what I think has the potential to become a big movement, which is the shift towards a mission-based investment philosophy, and some people are going to say, oh my God, he's dreaming. And yeah, I am dreaming, and I've been dreaming for a long time, but it's closer to reality than it's ever been. So currently, there's about $24 billion of money invested for mission. Um, it's expected, and you know, all of a sudden, we've got the United Nations, we've got the World Bank, oh, sorry, the, um, uh, the, the World Economic Forum, and we have the G8 with, with groups, task forces, that are studying the whole area of mission-based investing. So the projections are, that that market conservatively could be a half a trillion dollar marketplace um, uh, over the course of the next um, uh, five or six years. I'm not quite sure what the catalyst is going to be. But if, but if it is, what it implies is that that money is going to look to invest with an element that's not just financial return, which is important, and that's not going to go away, but also has a social impact component to it or a mission-based component to it. And if that really happens, then I actually think that it changes the question around the funding sources because most of the funding sources currently, um, and I don't know so much about um, Noah's business, but certainly for the CDFI world and mm -hmm. for others, comes from the banks. They are the core of the system. And they will be impacted in terms of their cost of funds by you know, whatever's going on um, w with, uh, with the Fed. Thank you, Tim and Noah. Now I think uh, we'll turn over uh, the questions to the audience. So your model's been running for several years. Do you have any questions? Your model's been running for several years. Have you seen small companies come back and take a second and third loan as they're growing? So what portion of companies are doing that in, in terms of that you can document it? Sure, yeah, no, I can, I can take that. Um, Yes, yeah, so we've been operating, our first loan was in August of 2007. It was a great time to start a lending company. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you, um, so we probably lost about a year, year and a half in the, in the chaos uh, that ensued afterwards. But, um, but, but we, it's, sort of, it's, a, it's a geometric series for us. So, so you know, if 100, 100 customers take one loan, um, 50 will take two, 25 will take three, 12 and a half take, you know, sort of works like that. Um, and we, as we've gotten better at remarketing to our customers and also as we've developed more of a longevity with certain pools of customers, we do see them coming back. Um, why do they come back? Uh, I think they come back for two reasons. One, there's episodic use of our product. So 
every 18 months or so, businesses need loans to grow, and, and that could be taking advantage of a special on inventory, it could be a remodel, could be investing in marketing, could be opening a second or third location. Um, so we see that kind of um, use case uh, where, where they sort of, they take a loan, they pay it down 100%, and they come back um, in, in the future. We also see people using our loans, um, and we've actually developed a line of credit product now to start addressing this. Um, they use them on more of a cyclical basis, and they have either um, periodic, sort of on the sub one year level, ebbs and flows in their business. So, you know, a classic example is the, you know, the, the pizza shop in a university town, right, that has three up seasons and one down season, or, or, the, um, or, or the retailer around Christmas time, or, or another one is a good example would be like a sporting goods store. It's like baseball uniforms in spring and, and football uniforms in the fall. And so, uh, so they, they come back for these recurring needs. And so I think that's, that's been sort of the dynamic. The average on deck customer takes over two loans with us over their life, as I kind of mentioned from the stats. And, uh, and we are seeing really nice um, kind of economic development within those businesses as they come back because we get to snapshot them over, over different time frames. Question. Um, Noah, my name is Keisha Cash, Impact America Fund. Uh, Noah, what's your average interest rate? And for Tim, can you talk a bit about more, more about the capital um, and the wraparound services that assist with that capital? It's one thing to plug a hole, it's another thing to actually provide resources for a company to grow, and I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Let me go first. So the interest rates we charge, and I'm gonna tell you a number that's gonna make all of your eyes pop out of your head collectively, um, are around 50% annualized. And so I just wanna put that into context um, when we entered the market and what was going on with these businesses. Um, not only were businesses declined in ridiculous numbers by the, uh, the existing institutions, but when they were declined by a bank, their alternative was a product called the Merchant Cash Advance that, um, whose effective annual APRs were around 150%. So since On Deck has entered the market, we've dropped the cost of alternative financing by about a third. Um, and also the way our business owners think about it is they think about it from a cost of capital point of view and a dollars and cents point of view as opposed to an APR. So our typical loan is about six months in length. The average in our portfolio is 10 months, but the most common loan is six months. And the entrepreneur will borrow a dollar and they'll pay back about 15, one five cents in interest and fees um, over that six month period. Now if they're using that dollar to buy inventory, let's say, and they're gonna mark up that inventory and sell it at $2 over that six month period, that's a 200% annualized return. That's the best use of our capital. If someone comes to us and says, you know, we're gonna consolidate credit cards onto an on-deck loan, we say that's a terrible use of our, our loan. You have to be using it for growth, or you have to be using it to absorb a speed bump in your business that if you didn't absorb it, it would get much more costly for you in other ways. Now, our lowest rate now is around 20%, and I'm very optimistic that as we continue to scale the business, our component costs will come down, we can keep lowering our rates to our customers, but I just wanted to be very clear about where we play today and how it relates to the other options that are out there. So, you know, our model, we have very little lending, Keisha, as I think you know. Um, and a large part of what we do is actually provide access to capital. Um, and the difficulty has been around the things that I mentioned earlier, which are really attracting um, the traditional uh, institutional capital to come into this space, which it will not do until we have you know, much better data than currently exists. And it's good to hear what Noah was saying about more data becoming available. We don't see it for the businesses that we serve. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a really big challenge that a lot of people are trying to think about. Fundamental in our business model is, is the advisory services. And actually that's what was fundamental in the merchant bank. It was less around the lending itself or, um, or the financing that they did. It was as much around the advice that was given um, so we um, provide very, very deep advisory services. So, you know, someone asked the question about repetition. You know, our first three clients eight years ago are still clients today. So they've been paying us retainers for all of that time. Um, we are very deep in implementation. We become an extension, effectively, of the owner of the business. Um, and our interest is to grow with them. So you know, I could give you three examples where um, over a three or four year period, they've gone from you know, 18 million of revenues one guy will do 70 million this year with 25 million of EBITDA. Um, uh, you know, a minority owned business, it's, it's extraordinary business. Um, you know, we have a moving company that's gone from 23 million, 24 million when we started with them to 40 million. Um, so the advisory piece is important. I say that I'm agnostic as to, if we had capital pools, I would be agnostic as to whether our capital went to that business or not. Our interest is in making sure that the capital stack for that entity 
is right for what they need. So one of those companies that was one of our first three, um, you know, he has the opportunity to acquire a parcel of land next door to him. Um, uh, he will build a new facility on that. Because he is classified as a light man industrial manufacturer in the state of Massachusetts, he's eligible for industrial revenue bonds. He didn't know that. It's our duty to tell him that he can get money at 3 or 4% coupon um, for 25 years that will finance 95% of that facility. As we move into lending directly ourselves, so the, um, the Northeastern Fund that I was talking about, for example, that'll probably have a rate somewhere between 8 to 12%. Um, and it will be, you know, we, we would see that as being the general target, um, you know, given the funding sources that we can get at. Thank you, Eric Bremen, Co-Founders Lab. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to ask if you could comment on um, emerging aggregators that are coming out there, like Fondera, uh, that are aggregating uh, alternative sources of financing for these ventures, and do you see it on balance as a good thing, perhaps because of the food court effect, or a bad thing because, uh, because you know, additional competition coming your way? Um, yeah, no, the, um, there's a lot of uh, aggregators out there. Fundera is, I think, the newest one to launch, but there's biz to credit Lendio. Um, there's one called Fundwell in Chicago that I'm aware of. Um, and so for the rest of the audience, what, what I believe is meant by an aggregator is um, just like when you go to a mortgage, you might get a mortgage, you might go to bankrate.com, and you would see, you know, here's a thousand lenders that have been called and picked for you. Um, you know, the SMB lending space has never been that commoditized. Everyone's criteria is different and um, process is different for underwriting a loan. So I think what these aggregators are doing is making a bet that over time, um, the, the interface to all of these SMB lenders will standardize and that people will be able to sort of go to a single place and, and, and shop among the different um, lenders in a very efficient and convenient way. And we're very supportive of that, frankly. So, so we're partners with Fundera, we're partners with biz to credit our, our, our view is we're not gonna pick a winner, we're just gonna sort of allow all of them to see what OnDeck offers, and if what OnDeck offers isn't competitive, then shame on us for not bringing something great to the market. Um, the flip side of it is I think people you can have too much choice, right? You go into the store and you want to buy some jelly, and if there's like 35 jellies on the shelf, like you're not, you're going to be sad, not happy, right? If there's three or four, you're happy. So we think a, a curated marketplace, you can go too far. Like for example, we have an office in Denver. I've walked into the Denver Economic Development folks, um, you know, kind of walk-in station for small business owners, and they have this big three-leaf binder, you know, three-ring binder of all the potential funding sources you could potentially go to. And you know, you've got folks who do government-backed funding of energy projects, you've got, it's too, it's intimidating. And, and so I do think that um, people like the one-stop shop. Um, there will be category leadership, I think, in this space, and, and obviously we hope to be one of the category leaders. So, uh, so I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So we, we don't think that they're, we, they don't make us sad, we're, we're very excited by their presence, um, but I do think there is such a thing as too much choice, and sometimes people get intimidated by, um, by, by looking at big directories of where they could go to get financing. Hi, I'm Pauline Barfield, President of Barfield Public Relations. How do you prepare um, the small business, um, the MWBEs, to um, prepare them for um, investors, to go in front of investors? I think this is for, uh, this question is for Mr. Ferguson at Next Street. Um, it, it depends. So um, it, any client of ours, the, it, it, if they have a capital need, then we'll work with them on that. We'll help them to prepare you know, some form of presentation. We'll often sit with them, you know, we go to a bank with them or whatever it happens to be. I mean, sometimes you know, one of the people that I mentioned earlier, um, who's a sizable business, um, he, the, the bank turned him down for a loan and he'd had a 17-year relationship with them. And, it, you know, again, different from the other one, he wanted to acquire a, a, um, an adjacent parcel to protect his own interests within you know, one of the neighborhoods within Boston. Um, and what he didn't realize is that the issue wasn't him. The issue was the bank. So you know, my partner, who's a former, com former commercial banker, went with him and had that conversation directly with the president of that particular community bank and said, well, the problem's really you, right? You're up against your lending limit. So let's figure out how we can be more um, uh, uh, creative 
about dealing with that. So for example, they could put a, a mass development, which is a, a government agency guarantee um, against it, um, and it would reduce, you know, re re increase the cap. For small, small businesses, it's much harder um, because um, usually they can't afford to pay our fees directly, but if, if they come into somewhere like SBS, for example, uh, where the average size of company is less than a million dollars, and often as small as you know, 50 to 100 to 250,000 dollars in revenues, we will work directly with them and then help them with the, um, the underwriting uh, with whatever the banks are that they're working with. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's very intense on a one-on-one on -on -one type of basis, um, you know, which is, and it makes me very jealous actually of, um, or envious of the, um, the, the model that, that, that NOAA has, which is you, know, you can scale much more. This is very, the work that we do, what we've learned is it's extraordinarily difficult to scale. I wonder if you could comment um, the services that you, you both provide um, are available through not-for-profit CDFIs, often at no cost or at much lower cost in terms of interest rates, and yet your businesses are both booming. So what, it, what is it that you feel that you're offering that people are not getting for free or at much lesser cost from, from more traditional CDFIs? So I would say, I want to go back to something I said earlier. The traditional CDFIs do not, for the most part, lend to small businesses. No, you, you may, <laughs> but you're the exception rather than the rule. And it's a, I mean, one of the, several of the leaders within the CDFI community have said to me, we will not go across that valley. It's very difficult to do, and some do. Um, you know, the, the rates that, that um, you know, for, for the most part, it's great. The more sources of financing that are out there, the better, from our perspective. And if a CDFI can provide the loan, that's great. Um, if a community bank can, that's great too. And it's, it's our obligation to make sure that that happens. In terms of the advisory work, um, I am yet to see, um, it, it takes a lot to have world-class advisory services and implementation to be provided to a small business. So, you know, this is controversial, maybe, but I think that you know, when I hear TA, I hear not high quality necessarily. Sometimes it is, but often it's not. And it's expensive to have to deliver that sort of thing. I mean, you know, I, I kind of joke about it. Um, you know, we're a for-profit business in theory. We've only recently started to make um, a profit because we've had to invest into the teams um, you know, to be able to provide the sort of services that we do. And even on a, on a um, you know, what we call a cohort basis, so we do a lot of work with companies under $5 million, we tend to do that with 12 to 15 you know, entrepreneurs, CEOs at a time. Um, and even that um, is, uh, even those are expensive programs to, to build and run. And without the support, for example, of government or anchor institutions, it would be very difficult to do it um, in a way that allowed um, you know, high quality services to be delivered to them. Uh, just to follow up, the um, I, I think the way we view it is, um, you know, clearly based on the rates we charge, we're not the low cost option in the market. I think sometimes with lending, people forget that it's a product like any other, and you can compete on multiple dimensions. And just like if I were buying a flat screen TV, price would be one thing I would consider, but picture quality and maybe if it was in stock and how fast I could get it might be another. Um, there's a reason why Federal Express and the U.S. Postal Service exist. So um, I think price becomes the other thing I would mention is I think people don't often uh, factor search costs into the loan. Uh, and, and so if you look at it on a search cost plus capital cost basis, I think our pricing starts to look a lot more rational um, in terms of why customers choose our product. Like one of the things that surprised us is that doctors who I thought were totally bankable, you know, folks with 750 FICO scores and $2 million practices, you know, they're one of our most common industries. Why? Because to get a bank loan, they have to step away from their practice three or four times to go to their local branch when they could be billing patients um, and performing procedures. 
Instead, and also there's a confidentiality aspect to it that they don't, they don't necessarily want the local community banker knowing they, they're applying for a loan for a radiology machine or to hire more workers or whatever it is. So, um, so they do it in the convenience at 10 o'clock at night. They get the loan quickly and, uh, and, and, and they feel well served. So I think that's it. We, we really sell on access, speed, and convenience. And over time, I think we will sell on price um, as we get more scale in the business. But today, it's really the first three. Hi, Ellen Morris from Embark Energy, and I had a question for Tim, because something you said resonated with me about these cohorts of entrepreneurs, uh, small, smaller businesses than your typical. Um, how does that cohort work? I mean, do you gather people into a classroom and offer those technical assistances, or how, how does it work? Because the, the model we have in East Africa is to have cohorts of really micro and small enterprises, uh, entrepreneurs in, um, in East Africa, and we have cohorts, and it's very challenging to figure out how to meet the needs of those in an efficient and cost-effective way, and I think I'd be interested to hear sort of how you manage it, but also your funding. You mentioned anchors and uh, government, and who are those anchor funders for you? So, um, for example, the, Ma the, Mass Department of, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation is a client of ours. They've just renewed again for another year. And um, what they have asked us to do is to find minority and women-owned um, businesses that can become part of their construction projects. And a lot, of the, a lot of state expenditures in general, I mean, the vast proportion is on construction of one description or another. So departments of transportation um, actually need to meet certain thresholds um, in terms of what they're looking for from a perspective of minority women, DWB in general, participation. So we find the businesses. We then work with them on a curriculum basis, so effectively classroom. Right? And then we provide after that some, it, it depends on who our client is, on some one-on-one on -one -on -one basis as well as they go through the RFP process and then look to um, execute against that. Um, and the people who are paying for it, in that case, the government's paying for it, right? And we like, we feel it's very important that the CEOs also have, you know, what's called skin in the game, um, and that they make some contribution towards, um, you know, the the cost. Often very small, but it doesn't matter because it's important that they come. Often the the hard the, the shift that's taking, or the, at least that we're seeing taking place in government, is that there's a a desire. One, to want to make sure that small businesses have more access and have um, opportunity to bid for contracts and understand how to do that, um, but that there's real impact and real results. Um, and you know, they're prepared to pay for that. And from their point of view, it's actually probably not a lot of money. In terms of the anchor institutions, um, you know, they're all non-profits for the most part, 501c3s. There's huge controversy around pilot payment in lieu of taxes. Um, this is a much better solution for them to figure out how to work effectively and engage with the communities surrounding the campuses um, than arguing about whether they should pay five million or ten million in additional taxes to the city. And from a mayor's point of view, from a city's point of view, um, you know their interest is in the job creation and the increase in the tax roll. Right? From our point of view, you know, we believe that the best social program is a job. So, so long as those businesses fall within the categories that we're talking about, so within the neighborhoods, that the communities that we serve, then you know, everybody's achieving their goals and their objectives. But, but actually, one other thing on the East Africa piece is that I was with someone a few weeks ago and was telling them about you know, the fund structure for Northeast, and he looked at me and said, Tim, yeah, I remember doing that in East Africa in 1995. So actually, there's a lot to be learned, I think, from the experiences in the non-US, um, you know, in the international microfinance um, advisory, whatever you want to call it, community, which I think is probably more advanced than it is, is here in the United States. Yep. Okay, uh, I've been asked to end this session at one o'clock to give you a little bit of time to get prepared for the other session, so let's thank our uh, panelists. Thank you.